Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street. Hope you enjoy this message and if you have any feedback you'd like to offer feel free to give me a call at 207-364-3856 or my cell phone 207-357-4748. Again, enjoy today's message. Thanks. Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 13, and today we're going to pick right back up with 1 Corinthians 14. But I just want you to please be in prayer if for either God to use you to manifest the gifts or for God to use someone else. Church, I'm serious. My goal is to see all the gifts manifested every time we come into God's house. You know, and last week we went over those gifts uh, prayerfully. Uh, last week's message will be on Facebook, and you can read that, go through that. Uh, learn the gifts of the Spirit so that we're going to see great things happening here. I firmly believe that next week, you know, or two weeks when we have our dedication service, I pray that God is going to be in the house. I pray that God's hand is going to move amazingly. I pray that God's going to fill these seats with bodies in it, living bodies of people praising the Lord. But let me share this with you really quickly. Friday night, I went over to Bethlehem, New Hampshire. Mary and Hannah and I, we went over there for the Light for the Lost uh, Men's uh, Missions event, and I showed a clip, and the clip was from... Burma, the country of Burma, and the clip was from, not an underground church, but it was from a church in Burma there where people have very little, and they, their whole weekend is devoted to just getting to church on Sunday, because they have to prepare the farm and all that all day Saturday, and then they get up really early, sometimes one o'clock in the morning, to travel to church to get God's house ready. And you should see it, guys. It's amazing where people from the front, the back, the left, and right, and they are all worshiping God. They are into it, church. I mean, it's amazing. You see that and say, wow, those folks and the sacrifice that it took, you know, to get into God's house. Think about it this morning. Some of you didn't even get out of bed until 930. We, oh, it only takes me 10 minutes to wash my hair and brush my teeth or whatever you did, and come on into church. You know, we hop in our comfortable car, and we get here, you know, at 930. Some of you know, you guys know what I'm talking about. Some of you were in bed at 930. You know what I'm talking about. All right? And so think about it. If you had to get up at 1 a.m. And, and tend to animals and walk to church and to do it and to come in and see the, the zeal and to see that the gifts of the Holy Spirit were being manifested in parts of this world is amazing. Church, we need the gifts in America today. We need the gifts to be manifested, which are healing, wisdom, discernment, faith, miracles. We need the gifts, not only just tongues and interpretation. We need the gifts to be manifested. And today, we're going to talk about my favorite one. Today we're going to talk about, you know, the importance of prophecy. Today we're going to talk about where Paul, you know, he sets aside 1 Corinthians 14 to go more so, you know, than, than the other gifts. He sets a chapter aside for tongues and, that, and, and the equivalent to tongue, I'm sorry, of prophecy. And the equivalent to prophecy is tongues and interpretation together so that there's edification and no confusion. But when you think about a church without, we learned last Sunday night that without love, the gifts are useless. So we know the foundation, of course, of the gifts is the love, the love of God, which we sang about earlier. But to see the gifts going forward, to see the gifts being produced in a time in which we desperately need them. And today, we're going to look at the gift of prophecy. We're going to look at why prophecy is so important for us as believers in these last days. I can't tell you how much it blessed me. I, where's Miss Rachel? How many did we have in the adult and teen class today? Do you remember how many were from the enrollment sheet? But I don't know. It must have been 25 in here. 25 adults and teens here for prophecy class at 9 o'clock. Why is that important? So that you can understand the signs of the times. That means, hey, maybe you got to get out of bed a little early to get here at 9 o'clock. Well, then do that. Don't complain because you don't know what's going on in the last days. If there's, a, if there's a class happening that's going to teach and elaborate on prophecy... Get there, praise the Lord, so you're not screaming at the TV when you see bad news come across it. Some of you do that. Some of you will be screaming later on today watching football. Like they can hear you. 
That's what my mother used to say to me. Well, we get it's the same thing with the news. What's going on? What's Russia doing? What's happening? What's the president doing? You know, and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you understand prophecy, you say, oh, this is what Jesus said would happen. This is what Ezekiel said would happen. This is what Daniel said would happen. My Lord's about to come. My Lord, church is like a train getting into the train station. You can hear it as it gets, it's getting closer. You know, you can hear it. It's just a matter. You don't need that blinking light to tell you. You can hear that horn coming a mile away. I bet, Miss Erica, I bet you hear that horn a lot at your house. Probably 2 o'clock in the morning. What is going on? A train rolling at 2 o'clock. But you can hear it long before it comes zooming behind your back door. You hear it coming. You know, you know what? I hear the horn coming. And Jesus Christ is coming back for His church without spot or wrinkle. Prophecy is so important to Paul and where he's, we're going to find out next Sunday where he said where he'd rather have one prophecy than a thousand tongues. You know, we would, we would find where, where prophecy is so important because it gives you understanding of what is going on. This is what prophecy simply is. Prophecy is simply declaring God's word or proclaiming a future event. That's all it is. And, and Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, some will be called to be apostles, some will be called to be prophets, some will be called to be pastors, some will be called to be teachers. But you know, prophecy to me is the most underused gift. And according to Paul, we're going to find it could very well be the most important. Why? Because love, love is what fuels all of them. And without love, you, there's no point in having any of them. But if you truly love this people and this River Valley, our mission field, we need to have prophecy to know how much time we have left. Pastor Vince, what an appropriate devotion for today. Where Jesus was on the clock because he knew his hour was almost at an end by that point. And as surely, sure enough, within 18 months, he was dying on the cross. And Pastor Vince said this morning, just this morning, hopefully you guys were listening. We have to take the same approach when it comes to the second coming of Christ. The second advent of Christ, we, the, it's only going to be day a little bit longer. And we're going to be raptured out of here. What's going to be the key? What's the secret to success to be able to do that while winning souls? I'll tell you what it is. It's prophecy from a loving direction for souls. You guys would be so kind as to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and we're going to be reading the first five verses here this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if you do not have a Bible or you cannot see it on the screen, just listen with your ears. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning with the first verse, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Paul writes this, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks the tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. The prophet Joel declares in the last day that God's going to pour out his spirit, Joel chapter 2. And God has certainly been doing that around the world, and many times uses the assemblies of God including praise assembly over the last 100 years, to see that prophecy fulfilled and to see God's glory take place. Some people choose not to understand prophecy, not because of just don't care, but more importantly, just don't want to take the time to understand it. Church, prophecy is like math class. You know, math class people always used to say this. Well, I'm never going to need that. I don't need that. Why do I have to go? You remember, any of you, any of you guys say that in high school? Oh, look, look, Brandon's raising his hand currently. He knows. Why do I need that? I don't need that class. Blah, 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 blah. Well, you know what? Prophecy. Prophecy, we have the same type of attitude. 
it just appears too hard. It doesn't appear important enough. If that be the case, why would Paul transition from the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, why would he transition to, pro to chapter 14, which has to do with prophecy and tongues and the gifts and being decent and in order, but especially prophecy? Why would he designate a full chapter? Because of the great value that it carried, church, just like mathematics. Parents, you understand the importance of mathematics Why you encourage your children to do their very best at the high school and the collegiate level and the middle school level so that they will, will become better students and better adults later on. Math, of course, is very important, and sometimes you don't, ex don't realize that until you get to adulthood. It's the same with prophecy. Prophecy is very important, but only once you realize, only once you mature in your faith, only once until you take hold of it. Because this is what happens. This is what I see happening. Even with pastors, even with pastors, and even in the assemblies of God, the only gift that we really want to see is tongues and interpretation. That's, or tongues especially. That, that's, that seems like the only way that one's Pentecostal. Hey, the, the, the gifts never move. The, the, no one never speaks in tongues. Well, that doesn't mean the gifts aren't moving. And we're going to find out next week that tongues is actually assigned to unbelievers. And where the saints come together, prophecy is so important because it's going to edify. It's going to build up the entire church. And what we want to do here is we want to prophesy. But let me tell you this, though. Before you say a prophetic word, you've got to make sure you pray it up. You know your word or you're going to be a false prophet showing the door. You know, that's, and that's, that happens a lot of times in assembly circles, too. People will stand up and give a word, and they don't know a bit more what they're talking about than anything. And church, this is important stuff, and that's why we're going to learn the last lesson is going to be to be decent and in order, and to make sure that we are in order, and if something's not in order, to be called down. But we need the gifts today. We need to be reassured that in these last days, we're going to be all right. We need to be reassured so that we're not sitting around panicking all the time, wondering what's going on, or complaining all the time because we don't recognize our country anymore. And church, let's step up and have an understanding an understanding from the Creator Himself. What is mysterious can be solved through prophecy. The question is, do we want to take time to do that? And people say all the time, Pastor, where do you get this stuff? Where do you get this stuff from? Right here, the Bible. It's just the books of the Bible that we don't open up. Open up. Do you know that two-thirds of the Old Testament is the major and minor prophets? Prophecy is the centerpiece of a lot of the writing and the point of writing of what was coming. The, the prophet Amos says this, that God will not bring forth judgment or move his hand until he first reveals his secrets to the prophets. And as God speaks, we can sit back and say, wow. Come, come Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. Fill this place up. Even invite other folks who don't have Sunday school and they, they want to leave and go to their own church, that's great. But invite them to come to Sunday school so that they have a knowledge because I tell you what, most pastors, they could care less about prophecy. They wouldn't bother them a bit to see 1 Corinthians 14 be eliminated. Be like a modern day Luther who took out the book of James. What's the point of it being there if it's not going to be manifested? Well, church, prophecy is, is so important. It was so important to Paul. It was so important to Paul who, who as the PHECA students are learning, wrote a lot of the New Testament while in chain while being persecuted. What is he writing about? Salvation, building faith, prophesying to the others, the other cities, the other churches, so that they may understand the mysteries of God. But let's break this down. Let's break this down in a full context of a passage, a chapter of Scripture, that even for some Pentecostals, they never turn to that page. How sad is that? How sad is that if we don't understand the gifts? Then we just come in. We come in monotone. There's no power. There's no miracles. There's no change. We feel like God doesn't speak to us, and we just go through the motions. It doesn't have to be that way. Through the gifts of the Holy Spirit and through prophecy, we can edify. We can leave knowing that we've been edified. We can know that God has spoken to us. Think about how encouraged we were, after missionary Chris Trueworthy prophesied over us that we would be a trendsetter. I'll never forget it. February the 18th, 2012, missionary Chris Trueworthy prophesied right here, live and in color, that we would be a trendsetter. We were excited about that. We were excited about that. 
And missionary Christian Worthy encouraged us, you know, to chase after gifts. And it was that a couple of months later was the last time that I preached on the, on the Gifts of the Spirit series. We even did a whole workshop upstairs for those of you that remember that. That's, time flies, doesn't it? It's almost been three years, actually. We're in 2015. Time is moving very quickly. But Paul understood the gift of prophecy, I think, more so than any of the other apostles. Uh, you know, with the exception of maybe Peter. But this is what he writes. Pursue love. Desire spiritual gifts. But especially that you may prophesy. That's verse 1 of chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. What does he say first? Pursue love. Why is that important? Because we just came out of the love chapter. And to pursue it, chase after it, recognize it. That is very important. If you're pursuing success, you know, if you're pursuing to win a gold medal in the Olympics for, for running track, you're going to be out there and building endurance. You're going to chase after it. Let me ask you this. Are you chasing after the love of God that we talked about last week? Are you chasing after the cornerstone? You know, are you chasing after a love you know, that will that never fails. Are you chasing after a love for God that's going to build your faith? And Paul writes there, to pursue love. Let me just say this, without pursuing love, prophecy is never going to be taken advantage of. Pursuing love is the, the ingredient because the moment that you pursue love, that's the, that's the ingredient to prophesy. That prophecy, that's the one God's going to open that door. You know, and Paul says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. So it's okay to desire the spiritual gifts that we talked about last week from 1 Corinthians 12. It's okay to desire those. We need to desire those. We need to pursue love. You know, and, and sometimes, you know, we, like right now, I'm pursuing the gift of healing, as I talked about last week. It's okay to do that. It's okay to chase after love. It's okay to desire the spiritual gifts that God so desperately wants us. So notice, though, they're not just going to fall in our lap. Notice you just can't walk into church and buy it. Or you can't walk into church and just, you know, pick it up off the floor. You know, this is something that is centered around pursuing love. It's something centered around a righteous desire. But Paul says here, but especially that you may prophesy. I shared with you guys last week that Paul, you know, he, 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 he really ranks certain gifts. That the Apostle Paul, he really desires certain things. And one of those things is that we especially, that we especially seek out prophecy. That we especially desire prophecy. And he says there, but especially that you may prophesy. Which means that you put prophecy into action. It's not just enough. It's not just enough, church, to, to chase after something. What matters is when we put it into action. What matters is some of you here have been given gifts, and when was the last time you used them? When was the last time you put them into action? What happens if, if, if somebody buys you a bicycle and it just sits out in your garage? That chain is going to start to rust. That chain is going to snap if you go out there and you don't oil that chain. You know, you just hop on there like you just bought it. You're going to go down the road, chain's going to break, and you're going to go tumbling down like Humpty Dumpty. You know, and that's going to be a bad place to be. All right? And so it's the same pursue that you may prophesy, pursue love, desire spiritual gifts, but especially that prophecy. And right now is a great opportunity for you to get on this train. Why? Because we're going to class Sunday morning. We're talking about it. This is a great opportunity to get interested in it. It's a great opportunity to open the books of the Bible that most people don't even want to touch. And there's so much information there. There's so much information. And Paul sets aside an entire chapter of Scripture on prophecy. And, and why it's in tongues and interpretation together are equivalent. You know, he, he gives us so much information here. It's tragic that this chapter of Scripture is so close to the love chapter, but people don't know it. People don't see the value. People don't see the importance of it. And how tragic is that? Verse number 2, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. And this, what Paul is, he's, he's dealing with the topic that we talk about even today, which is we've got to have tongues. Tongues, 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 tongues. And, you know, even, even non-Pentecostals, and you get talking, they, they, everything is tongues. You know, when it comes to a Pentecostal realm, how tragic is that? If anything, we should be saying everything is prophecy. 
We should be saying the gifts of the Spirit and desiring those. But what has happened? We've gotten so caught up in, you know, the, the tongues movement. Well, this isn't something new in America. Paul was dealing with it 2,000 years ago, too. Especially with the Corinthian church who was having problems being out of order. Completely out of order. It got so bad to where he tells women to keep silent and tells the guys specifically what to do and what not to do. Because it was completely out of order. People had no idea what they were talking about. And why were they out of order? Because they didn't understand prophecy. Why didn't they understand prophecy? Because they were too busy talking in tongues. Paul has specifically say that if, if there's more than two tongues in one, in one setting, then it's out of order. He had to give specific guidelines because people just got crazy. You know, you just had the, you know, the, what we call in today's terms, swinging it by the chandeliers and all this other stuff. Well, that's complete nonsense. Paul gives us order. He gives us instruction. And he tells us to pursue love, desire spiritual gifts, and tongues and interpretation are one of those. And he tells us to especially seek after prophecy. Okay, but then he addresses, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. How do you know that? Because tongues, you know, is an unknown language. You yourself don't even understand what you're praying. Praying in tongues is wonderful. I love to pray in the Spirit. It's wonderful. It's great. Where, where you just yield completely to God and He speaks through you. And it is a mystery to you, but God hears the depths of your heart and your soul. But it does no value to men. It does no, which is why it needs to be interpreted, which we'll talk about next week. But it does no value to men. It does no value to the body. Which is why if it's not interpreted, it must be called down. If someone is speaking in a tongue and all attention is on them, that needs to be interpreted. And if it is not, it is out of order. But notice when a prophecy is given, you are speaking in the same language, therefore you understand what the person is saying. Therefore God is going to get the glory completely from the body of believers. And prophecy is going to declare the Word of God or something that's going to come in the future based on the Word of God, and therefore that person is truth. But Paul writes in verse 2, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. What good does it do? Yeah, God's being glorified, but what about the people? It can also lead to the author of confusion, the adversary coming in. How do we know? How do, how do we know? Yeah, God knows, but how do we know? Therefore, people would get on the rumor mill, and next thing you know, you have people plucking like chickens and barking like dogs, and the laughter movement, that whole Toronto blessing nonsense that went on in the 90s that almost destroyed this church we're in, by the way. Two weeks is a miracle that we're going to celebrate 31 years. This church was about to close in the mid-90s, in the late 90s. I can tell you that right now because of nonsense. You don't believe me? I got videos downstairs. If you got an old VHS, I think we still got that thing back there that works. You know, and I can show you some of the junk that was going on. Way out of, way out of line. Way, not even nowhere near the Word of God. S making statements like, well, the Holy Spirit's doing something new today. In regards to being decent and in order. And that, that wave that came over. And then sometimes people made trips up there. And then they come back and, and, then, and when I came would ask bizarre questions like, are you kidding me? Are you, some of the things that, that were being taught up there and some of the, the stuff, go to YouTube and you can still check some of that stuff out. We're, we're, we're blessed to be uh, so open. Praise the Lord. I mean, it's, it's, there's no other way to put it. When Mary and I came here the first week, we went to the area of businesses, we introduced ourselves, we talked to people, we went door to door and all that stuff, and several people said, I'll never step foot in your church. And I was thinking, you mean, you mean the church over in South Rumford? We're not, we're not apostolic. We're, oh no, we mean your church. We had developed a reputation that was not good. There was uproars, there was problems, there was different things that went on between uh, people in the church, my own predecessor, some of the stuff he said to area churches. No longer in the ministry, but stuff, I mean, it was just way out. And Paul was dealing with the same thing here. But he said, especially you may prophesy. And, and when you speak to God and it's not interpreted, that tongue, it can bring in great confusion. Even if the original intent was good. But prophecy won't do that. Prophecy won't bring in confusion. Why? Because it's in the same language. It's assigned to believers. It's not going to be mysterious and you cannot argue with what was said. Now, if someone's a false prophet, they need to be called out and, and disciplined for that action. Of course. But as far as understanding what was said, 
It's not going to bring confusion. Which is why Paul writes in verse number 3, But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation to... I'm sorry, edification and exhortation and comfort to men. To the people in the church. It's going to edify. It's going to build up. It's going to bring comfort. And people are going to understand it. Church, I can't stress enough. We all understood when Chris Trueworthy said we're going to be a trendsetter. We all understood that. It wasn't in an unknown language where somebody had to question what was said. It was not anything gray about it. It was in the English language. We understood it, and we were ready to take responsibility for that prophetic word that was given over us. Amen. And that trendsetter prophecy is still carrying on today. I believe that. Still carrying on today to be used for God. I believe that wholeheartedly that God's going to do great things. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. If you remember from 1 Corinthians 12, the, the, you know, the first 11 verses and especially the first 5 verses where the diversities of, of gifts are given by God for the benefit of all. And that the God and the body would be blessed. The gifts, church, are God, certainly God needs the praise of His people. And, and if we don't praise God, rocks will cry out. But when it comes to the gifts, we're all going to be built up from them. It's going to be a blessing to everybody as the body of Christ. Which is why you need to be here, by the way. How can you be blessed by God for a gift if you sit and hope? Well, somebody just told me about it. I just watched it on Facebook. It ain't the same, church. Being there live and in color. You can't touch that. You know, uh, you should have been there today, man. We had two people get saved. Oh, that was great. I wished I'd been there. You know how many times I hear that? Pastor, I wished I'd been there. Well, where were you? Amen. On vacation every single week? Where were you? You know, God's moving. The gifts are moving forth. A prophetic word is happening to build up and to edify and to bring comfort to humankind. Where were you? Uh, blah, 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 blah. No wonder you're drifting from God, which is why the writer of Hebrews says, forsake not the fellowship of the brother. The gifts of the Spirit. And one thing we have that other evangelical or non-Pentecostal churches have is we have the use of all the gifts. We don't believe, as I talked about last week, that, that, you know, you know, that, that they died out when John finally died. We have, we have the use of all the gifts. We want all the power. Some, you know, churches, the, the gifts are not encouraged. The gifts aren't taught. They don't want to see it manifested, and it's no wonder people's faith is going. But we have it, and some people's faith is still going. Why? Because we don't understand it. Because we're not present. Therefore, we can't we can't be built up. Church, I can tell you firsthand. There are shut-ins that I go and visit. Hannah and I go and visit every Saturday that give their right arm to get back into God's house. They would. They'd give their right arm to get back into God's house, but they can't because their health is too weak. And the nursing home won't dismiss them. Or they're, they're just not able to, to get to the car without a, a lift or something along those lines. They'd give their right arm just to get back into God's house one more time. And here we are. We have all the gifts available to us. We're getting an understanding, especially of why prophecy is so important to build up men and women in the church. And if we're not there, we can't receive them. It's just, that's the bottom line. Being so close. Well, pastor, I just live a, I heard this not too long ago, I just live a mile away in the vibes. I can just feel the vibes in my apartment. Yeah? Come on now, church. I wasn't born last night. You should, some of the stuff people come up with, they got more lines than a sheet of music. I tell you, it's amazing. The stuff they come up with. God is so, when I want a revival, and when a revival comes, we must have the gifts, and we must understand them. And Paul is saying here that we, we manifest the gift of prophecy. That we manifest tongues and interpretation together. But again, we're going to find out next week, just to, just to foreshadow of it, is next week we're going to find that where tongues is assigned to unbelievers. Prophecy is assigned to believers. But Paul writes again in verse 3, But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. When was the last time you thought about prophecy as a sign of comfort to you? 
You say, Pastor, it doesn't sound very comforting to study the last days and what's going to go on. And that's, well, then you don't understand why Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. The greatest comfort I know of is thinking about the blessed hope in Jesus Christ coming to get me. It certainly ain't nothing coming out of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, I can tell you that. There ain't much comfort coming out of Augusta. There's not much comfort from even my own office talking to people because it's one thing after another having to deal with. Not a lot of comfort coming from there. What is my, the best comfort in the world is thinking about the blessed hope. Amen. Jesus Christ. Yes. Returning. Matter of fact, Paul later writes the first the Thessalonian church, you know, comfort one another with these words that Jesus Christ is coming soon in the twinkle of an eye. The trump's going to sound. Comfort one another with those words. And if you add prophecy to that, you're going to understand. You're going to, have, you're going to be exhorted. You're going to be edified. You're going to be comforted because you understand why prophecy is so important. Let me ask you this. Could you really explain truthfully and biblically and prophetically why you believe Jesus Christ could return at any moment? Be able to do that. Be able to answer that. To Even when the naysayer comes back and starts throwing things at you, including other Christians, you'd be able to say, well, wait a second here. I know the word. What you are doing in that moment is you are prophesying to them. For example, the importance of Israel. Why believers? Well, we've heard this for two. That's my brother says to me. Well, just we've heard this for two thousand years. Jesus Christ is coming back. He ain't come back yet. I really don't think he's coming back. Well, you know what? I come back and say, well, brother Jay, let's look at Israel. And I and I shared with him exactly what I did today in prophecy class at nine o'clock, and that brother was listening. My own brother. That's why I call him brother. From the same mother. We don't look like it, but we are. I mean, it's the, it's the truth. And, be, and that's, that's prophesy. That's, that's the gift of prophecy being manifested and being able to explain it. And you may not have time to pick up a phone and call me. Well, Pastor, what do you, what do you think about this? You know? Especially, guys, some of you, I had one person call me seven consecutive times while I was teaching history class to middle school uh, Friday morning. And I'm thinking, of it, who is calling me? It's like, I'm in class. You know, I may not be available is what I'm saying. You know, I may not be available 24-7. Pastor, where were you? You know, I mean, it's, we are, we're all busy. But if we develop the information ourselves, if we understand the gift of prophecy ourselves, and we apply it, wow, that's not wasting our time. It's instead using our time wisely. Let me share this illustration. High school geography class. Told our students Thursday, said, guys, we're, we're doing the states, the capitals, the nicknames, and location. And I say to these high school students, study these tonight. So we get to class Friday. We do our geography lesson. And we have 10 minutes left. I said, guys, they got a clean sheet of paper. We're having a quiz on, our, on the six mid-Atlantic states, capitals, and nicknames. <laughs> It's Friday. Yeah, it's Friday. Thank you for telling me that, but I thought I knew it already. I told you jokers yesterday to study these for today. Hint, hint. So they're sitting there, and I'm watching them. And I'm thinking, oh boy, grading these are going to be fun. And I was so nice that I went ahead and gave the New England states, which we had just did before, which we live in New England. And I said, you know what, guys? I want to give you some bonus points. Well, the next thing you know, I'm grading the New England, and we've got Concord over in Vermont. Boston's now in Connecticut. <laughs> Rhode Island, we can't even find. We got one person put that as Cape Cod, that little wing of Massachusetts, that Rhode Island. They think, oh boy, these are high school students. Oh. Well, let me just say this. Why do you say, Pastor, why are you saying all this? Because if we don't study and apply ourselves, when it's time to use the knowledge, when God gives us a quiz and sends someone our way, and we have to be his mouthpiece to that person, and we're sitting there, oh. Or people that aren't here and, and just don't see the importance of it, like I just preached on the one saved, always saved. God, last time, like this place would be packed out. People, God's finally laid on my heart to preach on it. You know, but, but folks that aren't here, it's like, well, that's why being here is so important, so that we can understand, especially 
the gifts of the Spirit in this context, and especially prophecy. So that we can obtain the knowledge, so we have something to study. So that we have something to put into action. So that we can bring edification, exhortation, and comfort to all men. Verse 4, he who speaks in the tongue edifies himself. You're building up yourself. But church, we already learned last week that the gifts are for the benefit of all. The, the gifts are for the benefit of everybody. Yes, don't get me wrong. Tongues is important. Pray in the Spirit. Paul writes that. Some will say, well, Paul was contradicting himself. No. What he's saying was, is that when you put on the armor and you're praying in the Spirit always, is that that's all about edifying yourself when you're by yourself. When you're praying to God, when you're grieving before uh, or interceding before the Lord, that's important. But when it comes to the body of believers and when it comes to a service, when it comes to Christians coming together, we have to be unselfish. We can't just be thinking of ourselves, but we must think of everybody. Everybody here. The believers especially. And Paul says, who speaks in the tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church or builds up the entire church. Church, this sermon is not just for Carolyn and, and Sister Mary and Toby. John, you come back next week. Next week's sermon's for you, brother. You good with that? Ron, you come back in two weeks and we just start assigning times. This message today is for everybody here. Everybody should be being built up and edified. And thinking about prophecy is huge. Some people, I think, that's what they think. I was talking to my wife a couple weeks ago, and while Crystal was gone, I was, I was looking at the attendance book for members. We take attendance for you. It's part of the secretary's job is to take attendance, you know, so that, so that we can record members. And I'm thinking, yeah, I can, I can. Let me just go ahead and fill this out for the next month because I know what weeks people will pop in and pop out. And you know what? Really wasn't that far off. We have some that just come just enough to say they're still a member. Just enough to squeak by. Or some that are non-members, you know, just enough to, to, to check that box, yeah, I go to church. Church, you don't come to church just to come to church. You come to church to worship God together as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's so important. It's so valuable. This is a taste of heaven. And God wants to prophesy. He wants to use us to prophesy. So why? So we can edify, exhort, and comfort one another. So that we can feel better leaving here. Rather than the same way that we came in. And let me just say this, seniors. I just want to throw this out here to you. Is don't stop serving the Lord. Don't feel like you served your time and you can just transition back into sporadic Christianity. Seniors, God wants to use you according to Joel. God's going to use the old men and He's going to use young men, praise the Lord. But you've got to be here to be used. You can't say, well, I served my time. This isn't the military where you do a four-year hitch and come home. You're a Christian as long as there's breath in your body, I hope. You want to serve the Lord to the very end. You don't want to just do a two-year hitch or a 20-year hitch and retire. What's up with that? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, yes, you may retire from ministry as far as a deacon or a Sunday school teacher, but you don't retire being a Christian. You don't retire saying, well, I don't need the gifts anymore. I'm, I'm past it. What are you kidding me? You know, that's crazy. That's crazy. But he who prophesies edifies the church, builds up the church for the glory of God, encourages the church, the full body. The full body is so huge. People asked me not too long ago, Pastor, how come we don't do cell groups? I'm not a big fan. Of, yes, the early church, that's what they used when they came together. But I'll tell you what, why do something that's going to benefit five people here? Why not do everything that's going to benefit everybody? A lot of cell groups, they have confusion because somebody does their own kit, does their own thing, brings alcohol out and serves that in a, in a, in a thing. You know, that just opens up a whole bunch of confusion. We had to deal with problem after problem in Maryland when we did those when I was on the deacon board. So why do that? Why do that if we can't invite everybody to a service? It doesn't make any sense. Why not bring everything together as the body to where everybody can be built up? I think for a lot of Pentecostal churches, they're in serious trouble because where do they want the gifts to be manifested now? Oh, in a cell group. Or oh, in your home. Well, prophecy's meant to build up the entire body. You're going to get the entire body in your house? Erica, can we all come to your house after church tonight? Bring 100 people in there. You got plenty of room for us? How about Allegra's? That used to be the church. We'll all just gather in there again. Think about it. 
Now, if you're having dinner with somebody, that's one thing. But, but when it comes to the body coming together, and for the entire body to be edified, there's, this is the taste of heaven. This is huge. This is important. This is valuable. This is unselfishness. And Paul understood it, church. Why? Because there's power in this wonderful gift. There's power, you know, in, in seeing the gifts manifested. There's power in pursuing love, desiring spiritual gifts. There's power to put them in action. Why? Because everybody benefits from them. Sister Mary gets healed. You know, or someone else gets healed. Mary don't need that walker anymore. Tell you what, I'm rejoicing just as much as she is. Praise the Lord. You know, it's, it's, it builds us all up. We're all excited about it. We all have, have, have a sense of comfort from that. And if it is something bad news, if it's something that's, that's, that's not great, you know what? There's comfort by consoling one another when there's something bad that we have to deal with together as a body. Making an announcement together to go through those things together. Lastly, verse 5, I wish you all spoke with tongues. Paul says that numerous times, actually, in Scripture. So here, Paul is not saying, you know, some that, well, maybe is he saying that tongues isn't good? What's he saying here? Well, he's saying here that he wishes that all spoke in tongues, praying in the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 6. He's not, he's not contradicting himself. He's giving explanation. Math class, again, he's given a formula to what works. You know, he's, he's given an understanding. You have to study those formulas. Right now, the, the general math class is learning all about area. And learning about area, and everybody knows the area of a rectangle and a square, you just add up the sides. But what do you do with a polygon? Lexi can tell you if you don't know, go ask her. Find the variables and then add up the sides. Right, Lex? Wednesday, we got a test. Study your formulas so you know that. Study the formulas. Study, there we go, studying it. But those formulas are huge because if you forget the formulas, you get all mixed up. What happens if I ask you, Carolyn, to find the area, and, and you thought I said find the perimeter, you start adding up sides, and all you're supposed to do is multiply the length times width. You've messed up the formula. It's the same thing with God's Word. People are messing up God's formula for the gifts because they don't know the formula. Why don't they know? It's there for them. They don't study and show themselves. Or the church or the pastor doesn't think it's important. Let me tell you something. I'll go on the record and tell you right now. It is extremely important that you understand the gifts. I'm not going to tell you they died out or we don't want them here. We'll call something down if it's out of order. But we want the gifts to be carried out. We want the congregation to understand them. I wish you all spoke with tongues. But even more, that you prophesied. That you prophesied. Tongues is one thing. Prophecy is another. For he who prophes But he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues. Paul says something greater. When it come, what, he's, what he's talking about here, tongues itself without interpretation is only great for the individual. Prophecy is great for everybody. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about one is more important than the other. He's talking about the platform that's going to hear it, receive it, do something with it. You know, that's why it's tragic in the last 50 years where, where tongues and interpretation and tongues has just overwhelmed Pentecostal circles and alienated non-Pentecostals. We have some churches that want nothing to do with the union services because we're still we're part of them. Why? Tongues. It always comes with tongues, tongues, tongues. You know, and that type of thing. And so here, Paul says, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets. So there Paul lets us know the formula again. Tongues and interpretation are equivalent to prophecy are equivalent to prophecy. And next week we're going to talk more about that to where tongues must be interpreted for this formula to be accurate. But church, let me just say this. I think Paul is saying clearly that prophecy you don't have to worry about. No confusion unless it's a false prophet that gives it. You know, that's why I praise God in advance that Hannah's going to have a Pentecostal heritage. I don't want her to have nothing else but the Pentecostal heritage. I don't want her to fall for the trap that the gifts aren't for today. 
I don't want her to just go through the lingo like you're going just to watch a show and, and something spontaneous or something amazing doesn't have the possibility of happening. I want her to grow up the same way I did with having a Pentecostal heritage with the gifts of the Spirit could roll at any moment and, and be decent and in order and that the body be built up. Praise God. I praise God for the heritage that I have. I want her to have that heritage. No doubt about it. I don't want her to be confused by some other teaching that, that the pastor doesn't even know what 1 Corinthians 14 is. I want her to have that. I want, her to have, I want our children to have that heritage. I'm so excited about children's church because it's all set up up there in similar format to what we do here. And for the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be manifested. God can even use our children. My wife can share with you story after story as God used her, especially ask my, my in-laws, how God used her with the gifts as a five-year-old little girl. It's amazing what God can do. That's what I want for our children. Church, our children can't be used with the gifts if they're somewhere else and they don't even know the gifts exist. And I'm not talking about some feel-good pet rally. Pet rally, what's that do? There's a pet rally. Come on, church, get serious. How many of you remember high school pet rallies? Does the pet rally, as loud as that get, does that really do you any good when you're on that field? It never did me any good. Not when that other team was bigger than I was. Hearing, the, hearing those kids earlier that day at the pet rally is not what carried me through. That's not what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about I got a dude across this line of scrimmage that's twice as big as me, and I got to block him, and that quarterback's behind me expecting me to block him. That pep rally ain't working. Seeing somebody in a blue face, that ain't, that ain't happening. That was my colors, blue and gold at the high school Cav Cavaliers. Pastor Vince and I stayed. For the record, he graduated 10 years before I did, so let everybody know that. You know, and, and, and so when you, when you think about it, that blue face with the gold letter, C-H-S, that didn't do anything for me. That didn't do anything. What did something for me was the skills that I had learned to do the best I could to block that defensive player, to protect our quarterback. Or if I was on the baseball field and that pitcher's throwing 90 miles an hour as a 10th grader, and I'm sitting there thinking, I can only hit 80, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to put the skills that I learned to increase my bat speed to hopefully be able to hit that 90 mile an hour fastball. I can't sit there and say, oh, all the cheers, all day, that, that's going to motivate me. I, you know, that pep rally's got me going. You know, and I got a 90 mile an hour fastball, or these, these guys now, they can throw curveballs about 85 miles an hour. It looks like a strike and it dips down in the dirt. You sit look like you're fishing, you know, and all that kind of stuff. You have to apply the skills that God has equipped you with. You can't say, well, that's no pitcher throws that fast to 10th grade. Oh, yeah. Man, they throw in 70 at Little League now. You watch the Little League World Series last month, them boys throwing 70. I know it's only 43 feet, you know, but there are 46 feet. They're throwing gas at, at, at 12 years old. You can't, well, you can't forget that, you know. You've got to face reality. Church, it's a, it's a tough world out here. And by saying that the gifts are not being used today, that is that, that church, that teaching, that pastor is shooting themselves in the foot and saying, adversary, you go ahead, you go ahead and have a five-run lead on us. Like giving the adversary a handicap for those of you that play golf. And here, and here's the gifts that I want our children, I want our young people, I want our adults, I want our seniors to have an understanding of the gifts, just like Paul wanted the Corinthian church to have. Why? So that the entire church could be edified. So that there could be comfort to men and women, people of all ages. And when you think about it, when you think about it, church, Paul was not wasting our time. Paul was not wasting space in the book of first, in his letter to the, the Corinthians, the first Corinthians, chapter 14. He was instead answering a mystery. He instead was answering and solving how to use the gifts effectively. And what you just heard this morning is how to do that. But more importantly, what are, what is the gift of prophecy? How is it different than tongues? Why is prophecy so valuable to us as a full body, not just a few individuals, but a full body to put prophecy into action. You say, Pastor, I, I, I still have questions. Well, get here Sunday morning so your questions can be answered. Because we're breaking it down. We're, that's all we're talking about is prophecy. Verse by verse and two-thirds of the Old Testament is prophetic. A lot of the New Testament, prophetic. The Gospels, prophetic. Revelation, prophetic. 
prophetic. Paul's epistles, prophetic. Peter's epistles, prophetic. We're going to study them all. Where you say, oh. You're going to study how to become a prophet is basically what you're doing. Now, you don't have to go church to church making offerings and taking up offerings and making a paycheck. You can be a prophet. You can declare prophecy as a gift of the Spirit just like you would praying over someone to be healed or given a word of knowledge or a word of discernment or a word of wisdom or increasing someone's faith, building them up in the supernatural faith of God. Prophecy is huge for us, church. But how can it be huge? We don't value it. We don't understand it. What good is the hammer if we keep it in the toolbox? That would be like if I went over to Chris and I saw him fixing the fire stones over there, and I said, uh, Chris, you're trying to hammer in that, that bolt with the, the back of a screwdriver. Have you ever tried to do that and all you had to do was walk out to your garage and get the hammer, but you wanted to save yourself a trip, so you're sitting there looking like an idiot trying to bang in a hammer with the back of a screwdriver, or bang in the nail with the back of a screwdriver. I'd be like, Chris, why don't you just turn around and get the hammer out of your desk? Well, I didn't feel like using that. I knew it was there, but I just didn't want to turn around. I didn't want to walk the extra five feet and grab it. So you're sitting there with the back of a screwdriver trying to bang in a nail? Well, you know what? After today, you're going to have the great, a great tool where Paul said, I especially encourage you to prophesy. Pursue love. Pursue the gifts. But especially prophecy. You have it in your toolbox. Study to show yourself worthy. Study the prophecy and apply it to life. You say, Pastor, but I don't, I don't, I don't like big crowds. Well, then prophesy and take somebody to get a Dunkin' Donut Coquilada. If you want to practice, call me up and I'll practice with you as long as you buy the culotta. I'll be there. You know, and if, if, I'm serious, church. If you, if, you, if you want to practice, you know what? Practice makes perfect. Ask questions. You know, do some acting, if you will, to, to, to open, sit down, invite somebody over to your house, have dinner, and sit down and say, hey, what do you think of the last days? And right there, you can start prophesying very quickly. But you have to know what you're talking about. Yeah, ice football start well starting Thursday, but it starts for all teams today and tomorrow night. You have no problem sitting around a table talking football. Why your team's good, why your team's not good. You have no problem sitting around doing that. Ladies, you have no problem talking about the deals you got at the, the, the gap or the coals. You have no 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 problem sitting around chatting, you know, about what color paint you're painting your studio. Why not sit down and prophesy to somebody? And all you have to do is, what do you think of these last days? Did you know the Bible speaks of them very clearly? Why not? Why not expect God to use prophecy here? Don't you think it's going to impact your life if you hear something out of your own ears rather than someone else's? Oh, I wish I had been there. Now, obviously, you're going to get sick, your kid's going to get sick. You take a vacation. But you know what? There's 52 Sundays in a year. There's 52 Wednesdays in a year. And we want the gifts manifesting to where when people walk in here, they feel and experience not only the love of God, but His precious Holy Spirit. And we want the gifts to be used for the benefit of all. Lastly, why do you say, Pastor, why are these gifts so important? Or how can I use these gifts? The only prerequisite is to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. And every believer here should have a desire to be putting the gifts into action. And, and the gifts are there so that we can be a witness for Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus. I heard the invitation earlier, but I, I, don't, I don't know. I didn't know what to do with that. I got up and I excused myself quickly because I couldn't handle the, the question. Well, let me take an extra moment to explain it. First off, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, you need to know Jesus loves you. And He went to the cross for every single person. And you need to know that it's the Father's will that none should perish, but all come to everlasting life in Jesus' name. And you need to know here that it is the Father who reveals the Son. You don't find God, He finds you. When I went to church as a 19-year-old to save myself from a Father's Day gift and take my dad to church, I didn't go there expecting to find God, but he found me. 
Okay, and you need to know that I have a, an invitation for you from the Father. It's from the book of Romans. It's an invitation not to go to a wedding of a bride and groom that's a male and female. It's an invitation to go to a wedding between Jesus Christ, who is the groom, and his church is the bride. And I have an invitation in my hand that I'm giving you today for you to hear, and that's to receive Christ to make sure you're going to be in heaven with the Lord. The first part of the invitation is that one must admit that we're a sinner. There's not one person that's perfect. Little Hannah was born into sin, the Bible says. I'm not going to have to teach her to do wrong. She's naturally going to do things wrong. We're all born into sin. We all fall short. We all have broken every one of God's commandments on that wall over there found in Exodus 20. By admitting that we're a sinner, we must admit that we need the Savior. We need the Savior, the one who shed His blood so that our sins would be blotted out. Our, our body and soul would be cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus. Secondly, on the, part of the second part of the invitation is we must believe that Jesus suffered and died for you and for me. He didn't just die for the people living 2,000 years ago. He's died for every person that's ever breathed over the last 2,000 years, including right now, which means you and me. Not only must we believe He died, we must believe that He rose again the third day to prove that He is the Savior of the world. The third part of the invitation is we must confess Jesus Christ. And by confessing Christ, that means that you're dead to sin and alive to Christ. That means that you no longer, you're no longer concerned about yourself. You're now sold out to Jesus. And lastly, Jesus called people publicly. He died publicly for you. And he called every person publicly. Little Zacchaeus was up in a tall tree because he couldn't see. He was a little short man. Most scholars say around 4'2", 4'3", in inches and feet, our dimension. But a little tiny man, Jesus called him publicly. He said, come down here, Zacchaeus. And then he said, follow me. His disciples, before they were called disciples, they were out fishing. Peter and Andrew, James and John, and Jesus called them publicly as they were out there and said, follow me. Matthew, who was a tax collector, his name was Levi, you know, in, in, in his office. And Jesus just walked in his office, didn't say anything but other than, follow me. And Matthew dropped, Levi dropped his stuff and followed Jesus. Matthew confessed him publicly. Timothy was called publicly. Hello. Thanks for watching today's message. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to each word of God as shared here today. I'd also like to take this time to invite you to our weekly services. Sunday School for All Ages at 9 a.m., Worship at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m., with Children's Church at 10 a.m. Also, we have a special men's and women's group at 5 p.m. on Sundays. During the week, we have several services as well. We have an extra innings class with me, Pastor Justin, on Tuesdays at 10. Uh, also, uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., we have a special class on Israel and the Book of Acts. Wednesday, we have a Love and Respect class for married couples, at 10 a.m. Also on Wednesday night we have our family night for all ages at 6.30 p.m. And lastly we have our food pantry on Thursdays with servings at both 10 and 11 a.m. May God richly bless you today. Thanks again for watching.